Hey everybody, hope you had a great weekend and are off to a really solid start to your week. We actually had a really busy weekend of news, a really busy 72 hours in fact. So I thought let's just catch up a little bit on some of the news that you may have missed. Hopefully you were able to relax a little bit over the weekend and we'll get you ready for the week ahead. As I look into different schedules, I sort of see, you know, what is the economic data calendar tell us? What does the White House schedule tell us about what to watch for this week? I, I'm going to knock on wood. I mean, we really, maybe twice. Uh, we don't see a bunch of really important landmark events that I want to call your attention to. That said, anything could happen because we know what happened last week. We weren't expected a leaked opinion from the Supreme Court and that changed the news cycle for the entire week ahead. So we'll leave a lot of room, but I think that's why it's important to kind of catch you up on these stories that happened over the weekend because any number of them could ignite into further storylines. So let's start off with what happened on Friday. We got a jobs report. A jobs report is our monthly report card about what does the job market look like in America. So we always pay attention to it when the news breaks, but I like to let it simmer a little bit because some of the data will sort of rise to the surface in the hours that follow. So overall, this is a really solid jobs report. We had more than 428,000 jobs created in America last month in April. That was better than expectations of 400,000. And there's always a game of expectations. So when it's better than expectations, that's also an added plus to this number, at least when Wall Street looks at it. You have the unemployment rate right in that mid 3% range, which is historically very low. And the job growth really happened across a lot of different sectors. So, you know, it was in leisure and hospitality, it was in manufacturing, it was in warehousing, a little bit of everybody got some job growth, also a positive sign. However, there were some concerns about what the data was showing us. Let me explain that a little bit. So the labor participation rate really tells us you know, how actively people are looking for jobs. And in general, you want people actively looking for work. That's good for the economy. It means we have less you know, for hire signs that are sprinkled across our community. That means more people are working, making money, spending money. That's good for the economy. It's more efficient for the economy if people are actively looking for work and getting jobs. And so the labor participation rate fell a little bit. And so economists are watching this. You know, one-off raises our antenna. We're going to wait to see what happens over the next couple months if that's actually a trend. But I think that's important to note. Something really funny happened in this report. I have to tell you about this. So 428,000 is the number of jobs created in the month of April. But every data point is re can be revised. So, you know, typically we'll get the number for the month and then we'll look back on the past months and see, you know, where the numbers revised up or revised down. And so we got the revised numbers for March and the revised number for March for job growth in America was also 428,000. <laughs> So I don't know if that means we should all buy a lotto ticket and pick 428. Maybe that's our lucky number for the week. I don't really know what to make of that. I don't know statistically what the chances are of that. If you're a statistician, please tell us. But that's just unusual. So I thought I would mention it. So we'll watch to see what does this, what does the next job report show us in general when we talk about the jobs reports? And I have, I've had to say this for two years. Hey, we've seen job growth, but we're still missing and I always say that number, we're still missing a certain number of jobs that we have not recovered from before the pandemic, what the economy looked like before the pandemic. Listen, we're still short more than a million jobs since before the pandemic began. But economists think if the pace of job creation continues, we'll make up that lost ground by summer. So the pace and the trends are really important, and we'll continue to watch that. Speaking of statistical chances, let's talk a little bit about what happened on Saturday, the running of the Kentucky Derby, historic horse race in America. Almost 150 years old, you got 20 horses going for it. There's always alternates and sometimes these alternates, they get to run and sometimes they don't. It didn't look like Rich Strike, which was an alternate, the 21st alternate was going to get a chance. They got a call and said, hey, sorry, guys, you're not running this year. But then they got a second call and they found that they were running. And then they won the entire race. <laughs> And the odds were stacked against them. They were the definition of that saying. And yet the team won the race. One of the greatest, biggest upsets in a, the nearly 150-year history of the Kentucky Derby. So just a reminder to us all that we may not feel like we're going to get our chance, but when we do... You know, we got to go for it. And Rich Strike did. It's an interesting day to keep in mind Saturday, not only because of the historic tradition of the Kentucky Derby, but we know one of the big stories about the Kentucky Derby is always the fashion. You know, what are the women wearing? What sort of crazy hats are they wearing? That's always part of the day. We actually linked to 
couple of uh, slideshows on that on our website if you want to check it out. It's always fun. But think about that news juxtaposed to some other news that we got on Saturday. So also on Saturday, in a land far from Kentucky in Afghanistan, the Taliban issued a new decree. And the decree says that women now have to cover their faces in public and really shouldn't leave home unless absolutely necessary. Why does this matter? Well, we know in the past, in the past previous times where the Taliban have taken control of Afghanistan, women had to wear burqas, which were you know full coverings with, with just vents for the eyes. Typically, in Muslim nations, we expect women to wear hijabs, or these are head coverings, but their face is commonly exposed, even though their necks may not be. Their face is exposed. So this is a marked change if they're not able to even show their face, and they can only show their eyes. So it's something to pay attention to because in the past few weeks, we've also seen the Taliban pull back on education for girls, saying that girls really shouldn't be educated past the sixth grade. So again, this is a trend we're seeing from the Taliban. We know the Taliban of the past in the strict adherence to Islamic law and their interpretation of Islamic law provide a safe haven for terrorist groups that share the same ideology. And so that's why we're also paying attention. It's not just about women's rights, although that's really important. It's also about what does the leadership of this nation look like and what does the future bode for Afghanistan? By the way, although there's a lot of focus on this, we also have to remind ourselves there's a huge humanitarian crisis happening in Afghanistan. It's not just about what people are wearing. It's whether or not they can actually get food or they're able to feed their family. So I want to pay close attention to what happened in Afghanistan. We're not even a year out from the withdrawal of the United States. So let's watch what's happening in that nation. And that kind of leads us in, what's happening to women in Afghanistan leads us into Sunday, a day where we separated, celebrated mothers, right? Mother's Day in the United States. And we saw First Lady Jill Biden celebrate the day by visiting Ukraine. She was in far western Ukraine, so far away from a lot of the really intense fighting in the eastern part of the country, but her presence still matters. Yes, it's a media event. You know, she was take, she's taking photos with the First Lady of Ukraine. She had been visiting uh, refugee children in Eastern Europe, but this matters. This is a moment for the Biden administration that they have methodically stayed disciplined in having high-profile members of the administration visit that nation over the last several weeks. So we've seen Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State visit Kiev. We saw House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and a Democrat delegation also visit Kiev over the weekend. Now we have the First Lady. No, the President has not gone yet, but we'll watch for that. We also saw on Sunday uh, over the last 24 hours that Bono... <laughs> Not a member of the Biden administration, but Bono, obviously a very popular uh, star, uh, member of the group U2, singing in the subways of Kiev. You know, it's, it's the world trying to show we're paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine. In the meantime, we're also paying attention to what's happening in Russia. So on May 8th, it's VE Day, uh, Victory Day in Europe, the end of World War II. That's when Europe typically celebrates that. It wasn't the end of World War II in general because they were still fighting with Japan in the Pacific, but the end of real fighting in Europe in, uh, in World War II. Russia celebrates May 9th, and this is a day of intense patriotism and pride. We always watch what the president, Vladimir Putin, says on this particular day, and we were watching his speech today because we were curious how he would describe what's happening in Ukraine. Would he telegraph any future strategy? Would he actually use the term war? Remember, he hasn't used that term. This is a special operation that's happening in Ukraine, the denazification of Ukraine. No, he didn't use he didn't use the term war. And remember, the public has been greatly censored to outside information. So just important to watch. There's been a question about with the momentum from this patriotic day, this holiday, would we see a doubling down of violence in Ukraine? So we're going to be watching very closely the week these this this contested area in the eastern part of the country. Again, why are we really watching the eastern part of the country? We're really watching the coast. The coast of Ukraine matters to Ukraine for the economy and for for, for their national security. Russia's really contesting an area of Eastern Europe. They've been for eight years, but have extended that. And we know that the Black Sea is a really important waterway for transportation for Russia and for their own military strategy. So a lot to watch in Ukraine, and we'll certainly be doing that. Real quick here, I don't want to forget this. I have this in my notes. Over the last year, I've gotten a lot of questions from, from many of you about January 6th, because we know there's an investigation that's happening in Congress. We know that's taking place. We also know that there's people that are awaiting trial for allegations related to January 6th. So here's what I want you to know. We are seeing signs that the investigation by Congress is wrapping up and that we could potentially have public hearings in June. Why does this matter? 
any time that we've heard anything about this investigation, it's been reliant on the characterizations of those that are in the room. So politicians of different persuasions and those that have participated. Nearly a thousand people have been interviewed. So we haven't been able to hear that from primary sources. We haven't been able to watch it for ourselves. And that's really important. So that could happen in June. I want you to be aware of that. June is also when we could get all of the decisions. We will get the decisions June, early July from the Supreme Court. And so June is shaping up to be a month where the term primary source is really important and it's one that will be here. My kids might be hand, you know, hanging from the chandelier. Uh, summer vacation is always an interesting time for any working parents, <laughs> but we will be here and we will be looking for primary sources. For the Supreme Court, it's really important because when you get a decision, you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about this leaked opinion, but when you get a decision from the Supreme Court in June, guess what you'll get? You get the majority opinion and you get the minority opinion. You get both at the same time. You could look at both at the same time and that's always more productive. So June, primary sources is the key word for June. In May, our lucky number is 428, <laughs> going back to the jobs report. And rich strike, always always bet on the underdog. I think that's the other takeaway from, from what we got in the news cycle. So all of these stories and more are on our website. So please go ahead and check that out. If you'd like to read a little bit more, link to more information that we've, we've looked at and curated for you specifically. And of course, questions and comments, let me know. And always more at smarternews.com. Have a great week. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter. <laughs>